Uh, Terry Song, Chair and Business Representative. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Diane Taniguchi Dennis, I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Clean Water Services. It's great to have you all here. Hi, I'm Nisha George. I am the at large rep. Randy Lawrence, I'm the Project Manager of Clean Water Services. Happy New Year. I'm Jill Eriks. I'm the Division Manager of Water Water Systems. I'm Kathy Leader, Chief Financial Officer with Clean Water Services. Amy Hughes, I'm a Program Manager in the Green Affairs Department for Clean Water Services. Tracy Rainey, I'm a Senior Policy Analyst for Clean Water Services. Good evening, Joe Gall, I'm the Chief Utility Relations Officer for Clean Water Services. Bill Fee, Chairman Spokesman for the Washington County Citizen Action Network. Shannon Sunderland, Chief Community Engagement. Jack Lamont, Chief Business Operations Officer. Rich Hunter, Division Manager in Natural Systems and Natural Stewardship at Clean Water Services. <laughs> Robert Emanuel, I work in Natural Systems and Natural Water Services. Okay, I'm going to more things to stick to. Mike, on the board. Uh, touching it down. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike McKillop, District 3. Alex Spann, District 1. Mark Farrow, one of the builder developer representatives. Matt Weller, uh, the other builder developer rep. Andy Haugen, District 4. George Marsh, um, Ag representative. Alan Jesse, Ag rep. <laughs> and good evening. I'm Stephanie Morrison with Ag Water Services. I'm going to uh, go ahead and go to the folks online and Lane, I see that you have joined us also in one of our newest commissioners. Can you introduce yourself, please? Make sure we can hear us. Hi, I'm Elaine Stewart. I'm one of the environmental reps. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Jerry. Jerry Linder, general counsel for clean water services. Happy new year. And the other ones are just uh, with us. Well, thank you. That's that's introductions. <clears throat> Mr. Jackers, we also have Joy Ramirez of Clean Water Services on with us. Audio only. Okay. Joy, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, I'm Joy Ramirez. I'm the uh, Environmental Service Manager within Reg Regulatory Affairs. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so, back to you. Great. So, we have a new procedure for the mission summary. There's no changes that the commissioners must acknowledge that we review and accept the summary. Hearing okay. no changes, we'll accept the summary. So I will do the next thing so you don't have to introduce yourself. So um, we have a lot of administrative pieces to do in this first uh, meeting of the year. The first one is the selection of a chair and a vice chair. Terry Song here was elected chair a year ago. Um, what, what we need to do is entertain, and then first of all, a motion for a chair. So if somebody wants to move to... <clears throat> we nominate Terry Song to be chair. Second. In perpetuity. <laughs> I, I object. <laughs> so I guess I'll call the uh, vote on that. All those in favor. All right. All right. Second one is wide open in terms of a uh, vice chair. Right? And basically, your responsibilities as a vice chair is to run this meeting in the case where we let Terry not attend or something like that. Um, does anybody have a willingness to step up and do that? We're going to have somebody do it. We could nominate somebody who's not here. That's <laughs> always a strategy, but no, we, we should not do that. <clears throat> that would be a good one. Thank you. <laughs> so, would you be willing to do that? Okay. Is, is that a motion? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Good. Good. All those in favor? Uh, <laughs> <bang>. <laughs> um, Thank you. So the next piece, and I, I, let me just go away. 
of the uh, nomination and confirmation of budget committee members. Kathy, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Kathy's our chief financial officer. Maybe we have some slides on it, right? Look at that. We have slides on it. <clears throat> Yeah, so this is uh, an annual process we do too with the the CBAC uh, group. So um, this so just as a background, so budget committee is a requirement under Oregon budget law, and the committee is made up of our um, five board members from our services and and five citizen members that come from uh, the CBAC. So you're the, the, the member representing the community. Uh, the members on that committee would serve three a three-year term, and you must live in Washington County or CWS territory. Sure. Right, this is just a nice little timeline to give you an idea when you're on the budget committee what you're what will be happening. So today, January 11th, we're we come to CWAC and are asking for nominations for the committee this year. February 7th, we'll take those nominees to the board in a work session to get and have a dialogue on who is nominated. Then, then, based on their input, we come back March 7th to the board and they appoint the members as they are on the budget committee. April 21st, around there, we, we push out the proposed budget, that be budget for 23 24. Um, and May 5th is the biggest commitment of the member, and that's the budget committee meeting that happens, where we um, present the budget message, and you would deliberate, hear public comment, and then uh, approve a budget that would then go June twentieth to by public hearing for adoption by the board. And usually at the June twenty meeting, the the, the chair or of that committee would present uh, as part of the June twenty public hearing. So positions So we have the, the five positions right now, we have um, two individuals, Mike McKillop and Matt Wellner that are um, their term expires. Uh, it's expired in September of 2022. It's a three year term. Um, so um, th those are open to be filled for another three year term. So it would be in 930-2025. Terrence Song is, is a current member and his term expires in September of 2023. So still a member with us. And we have two positions that are in the middle of their term, but they have left CWAC, so we need to fill those. That would be Laura Henning's position in, at Edema Tejada. And they, um, their term ends 9-30-2024. So when you go in that on those two positions, they would be a shorter term opportunity. And that's just showing uh, the existing one member and the vacancies we need to fill. Bring this forward for nominations. One day commitment. <laughs> um, and you do, and she's, she's underselling it a little bit. It is a nice, thick document that you get to. Yes. But um, it, it is a real opportunity to, to, to work with our board. It's typically that budget committee meeting will run through about nine in the morning to two in the afternoon. We'll meet you like we did today. Um, and we need to bring a slate of four people to our board. Anybody want and that on? Can you do one of the detail of clean water services and all of the programs that we have and where we're making our investments um, in terms of the services to our ratepayers and also the investments we're making in the watershed? Yeah. So it's a really good place to work for what we do. We do it. We get to engage with all these like clean water services that are presenting it. So, you know, the county commissioners. From the county commissioners, yes, our board of directors. So, I don't want to undersell it. It's actually a good committee to be on. The question I have is <clears throat> are the ones who get, just got turned off, are they eligible for another term? Yes. Yes, well, absolutely. <laughs> I would volunteer for one of the shorter terms just because that's the only. But if there's four people that already want to do it, I don't have to be. I will volunteer first. 
Was whoever speaks first? Is that what I mean? I was also going to be one of the kind of people on the sparks. I did get the water board, first as the finance budget committee. I'll find out. We need one more. This is Elaine. I don't know if anybody can see my hand raised on the WebEx, but I'd be happy to be on the budget committee for whichever term you need to plunk me into. So that I can go off. Thank, thank you, Elaine. Thank you for raising and noticing they're saying that you raised your hand too, because I was looking at Perfect. So right now, to summarize, we've got Elaine, um, Alex, Ramesh, and Mark as the four people um, <clears throat> that would be take a motion to nominate those four people as recommendations. Oh, can I make an amendment to that? Yes. I'll let uh, Matt go on to the committee. Uh, he commit is the one that Terrence will get on with 2023. That we are at least getting a preview of how we can go. If it's okay with you, right? Sure. So, yeah. <clears throat> but I will be in back along. <laughs> As amended, uh, a motion for that slate of candidates. I will. Second. 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 So well, why don't we vote on that? And just to, let's be clear to Lane, Mark Farrar, Mark Sam, um, and Matt. And Matt Weller. Well, thank you. So, Lane. No, 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 I think it's a short one. Matt, it's an So, with that slate and that clarification, thank you very much. Thank you for taking care of the administrative functions. So, with that, I will hand it back to you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, next item on the agenda is the state and federal legislative agenda. Tracy? Yes, Susan. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, it's a long trip. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, it's nice to have met a few of you and to see you all in person. Um, I'm Tracy Rainey. I am a senior policy analyst with Clean Water Services. Um, I have I currently work primarily in government relations for the district, um, and I've been with Clean Water Services now for just about a year and a half. So time flies when you're having so much fun. Um, prior to that, though, I worked in government relations for both um, League of Oregon Cities as well as the Special District Association of Oregon. So worked. Fairly extensively in local government um, policy work when I was at League of Oregon Cities, which was over about a 10 year period. I was primarily focused on water and natural resource issues, but I had a few other issues that were far less fun for me. So when I got the chance um, and, and the opportunity came up to come to and work with Clean Water Services and fully focus on water issues, I was ready to jump at the chance. So. Um, it's been really exciting to be over here and to um, kind of get to know the district even better and to begin to work uh, through the process of developing a state and federal legislative agenda for 2023. So tonight we'll be reviewing over um, kind of the work that went into the development of those agendas um, and um, what we're kind of expecting in the year ahead in terms of our advocacy efforts at the district. Okay, there we go, it's working. Um, so the issues that are listed up on this slide um, are those items that were identified through uh, essentially an internal review process that we did at the district, um, pulling a variety of staff representing different departments within um, Clean Water Services to identify some of the key legislative issues, policy areas where we may wish to engage for the upcoming 2023 state and or federal um, sessions. So um, once we kind of went through that process, which took place in um, the late summer, um, we took those items that were identified by our staff internally, 
um, really figured out where we thought that we should plug those into our either state agenda or our federal agenda or potentially both if that was appropriate. And then in the fall, uh, this just this past fall, uh, we began the work in conversation with our board of directors, so also the board of county commissioners, um, who met several times in October, November in work sessions, and we talked through um, what then was our draft state federal or draft state legislative agenda, as well as our draft federal legislative agenda. Um, got some good feedback through that process. And then in December, uh, we were able then to um, seek their approval, final approval of both of those agendas so that we are, are ready and prepared to move forward with the coming uh, legislative session in, in Congress as well. Um, so first, before I kind of dive in to specific issue areas, um, just going to provide a quick little overview of the state legislative process, and then we'll talk about federal uh, next. Um, as many of you are likely aware, the state legislative session is um, just about to begin. Um, we are expecting to be engaged in a number of issues, including some proactive items that we've identified and that will be working as part of our state legislative agenda. Um, but we'll also be closely monitoring a number of other issues that could impact the district as we work through the legislative session. Um, as you're likely aware, maybe aware, maybe not, Oregon's legislature does meet every year. Um, so they do meet annually in odd number of years, like this year we are in. Um, they meet for what we call the long legislative session. So they are constitutionally limited to 160 days. So they will be convening starting next week on Tuesday, January 17th. And they are required to be out of that building um, by early in June. Um, they will try and get out early if they can, but we do have a lot of new legislators this session, so we'll see um, if they're able to get out a little earlier than that constitutional deadline. Um, for the long legislative sessions, we tend to expect about 3,000 bills. There we go. It's back. Okay. Um, about 3,000 bills that will be introduced. Um, it's important to note that only about a third, a quarter to a third, I think, you know, Mark and I have this conversation, like, how many do we think pass? About a quarter to a third typically do pass, and that includes um, well over 100 bills that are pertaining to state agency budget. So uh, things that they need to pass just for a biennial budget purpose. Um, but we will see a number of bills that will move forward this session. More bills will not move forward this session. Um, and this week, the legislature did already convene for the purpose of swearing in newly all elected um, legislators as well as other state elected officials. Um, they're also doing organizational days and trainings right now. And with that, they were able to convene and that provided us the first opportunity to see um, the initial round of bills that are being introduced for this session. So on Sunday night, I got a text that said the bills are up on, this, on the website. Um, and so we've been flipping through those bills. There's over 1,800 bills that have been posted already. Um, so those are just the recession filed bills. And um, we'll expect to see another 1,000 or so bills that will be introduced in the coming weeks and possibly even months ahead. So any bill that's not been introduced here in the next month probably doesn't have a great likelihood of success just because there are some legislative timeframes that they're um, working up against. So um, also in terms of what to expect for this legislative session, there are some unique um, kind of aspects of the session um, that I'm not really quite sure yet how it's all going to work. I think a lot of um, people working in lobbying or government relations are very curious to see how it all unfolds. Um, the Capitol building is currently undergoing construction. Um, this is the first time in several years that the building is open to the public after the pandemic, which is really great news. It has been, uh, for the most part, working remotely um, with legislative committee hearings taking place and people only able to participate virtually to provide testimony, um, most legislators not taking in-person meetings. So we are making progress and it will be open to the public, but with the construction that they're going to be um, Facing, they are closing off a majority, a good 
chunk of the building. And so they basically have one hallway where all the committee hearing rooms are, and then they have two wings where the House and the Senate offices are located. Um, so I went there in December just to see what that was going to be like and to provide some um, testimony, and it, it's not a lot of space. Uh, the fire marshal is saying, or what we're hearing is no more than 500 people in the building at a time. So as you can imagine, as lobbyists, legislators, members of the public are trying to access this process, it's going to be really interesting to see how they manage that, that challenge um, for the building going forward. And also um, how they manage the lack of outlets. I think it's going to be really challenging for lobbyists because you have no place to put your stuff. You can't really plug in to charge your phone or your laptop. So it's, it's going to be an interesting experiment um, for this session. Um, in addition, on this slide, I've got kind of a legislative makeup for the House and the Senate. Democrats do have a majority in both chambers, but are just shy of a three-fifths supermajority. And so basically what that means is they're going to need bipartisan support if they're going to pass any revenue raising measures. So any new taxes would need to get bipartisan support. Um, also, in kind of looking at that legislative makeup, we've got a lot of new legislators coming in. So there are 26 new legislators. So nearly a third of the legislature will be new and has never served before. Um, so there's going to be a, a huge learning curve there, I think, for them as they staff up and get to know the building and the process. And then when I went back today and actually looked at how many of them have experienced a rig, what I would call a normal legislative session, uh, before the pandemic, about half of them have never experienced a normal legislative session before. So there's going to be a lot of learning, um, and then you combine that with the capital construction. So it'll be interesting uh, to see how it all unfolds. Um, one final note is the um, state economists are now saying that we are more likely than not to see a mild recession in the coming years ahead. Um, there's been several uh, presentations to the legislative revenue committees. And so we're really starting to sense from the legislature that they're going to be you know, tightening um, their kind of approach overall to budgetary requests. So we're definitely getting that sense. Um, that has not been the case in past years, despite there being a pandemic. There has been actually quite a bit of money that has been flowing into the state, um, it, mainly in part, I guess, in part, but a lot of it has been around pandemic relief. Um, and so those days are definitely over. Um, so we're going to see a lot of, uh, I think, tight competition for limited dollars this session. The session will be no more than a recession. The recession. Oh, the construction. Oh, the construction can last. Okay. Um, that I, I, it should be finished by the next regular legislative session. Okay, so it won't be during this legislative session. This one will just be special and yeah, yeah. So it better not last for two years because I think you're gonna have a lot of people with very, um, very short nerves by the end of this session, to be honest. So um, so in terms of in terms of how we're going to be engaging in uh, legislative conversations this session, fortunately we have worked to cultivate some really um, key partnerships with organizations which is gonna allow us to uh, really coordinate on key legislative issues. Um, we'll be really working really closely with the Association of Clean Water Agencies or AQUA, if you're not familiar with that organization. It's a statewide membership organization that represents the community. Um, their membership is comprised of water resource, water resource recovery, utilities. Um, and we are pretty actively engaged in that association. I'm serving currently as the co-chair of their legislative committee. So they'll be meet, uh, meeting regularly throughout the session um, to review bills, um, provide technical input to some of the lobbyists from League of Oregon City, Special Districts Association of Oregon, um, and to figure out where there's need for testimony um, or outreach to legislators on key issues that are primarily focused around water quality. Um, where it comes to some other broader legislative issues, things like public records, public meetings, public contracting. Um, we're going to be relying and working really closely with some of the statewide associations. So Special Districts Association of Oregon is one that we'll be working with closely. I'm on their water committee as well. Um, so we'll be meeting regularly throughout the session. 
And then Washington County Government Relations as well will be helping um, any issues that have a broader impact that aren't really specific to water quality for us. Um, Clean Water Services will be engaging on a number of issues. I've seen what I've seen out of those 1,800 bills already. Um, we won't be bored. So there's going to be plenty for us to work on and engage in and provide input on as, as this process evolves. Um, so as part of the 2023 state legislative agenda, which was adopted by the board back in December, so pretty recently, um, we did include a guiding principle, which is up on the screen here. Really, this is just intended to provide very broad guidance to us on how we'll approach various measures during the legislative session. Um, certainly, where we've identified priorities and can bring legislation forward, that's wonderful, but most of the legislation we're going to see, we never expected. So this guiding principle is going to give us that ability to really take a look at it and see where we should engage and how we should engage um, in, in the advocacy efforts going forward. So the more specific um, kind of what I would say are probably more proactive legislative items that we identified for the state legislative session are on the screen. Um, they include additional funding for infrastructure, water infrastructure. This one will probably always be on the screen, I think, because it's gonna, I don't see a day when we're gonna say, okay, we have enough investment in water infrastructure, we're good now. So um, this one is ongoing, um, but we'll continue to kind of carry forward that message. I think especially with recent federal investment in, in uh, water infrastructure, um, I'm hearing from some other uh, government relations with other states that their state legislature is uh, assuming that they can back down on their investment. So we wanna make sure we're really carrying that message forward through the session. But we still have a lot of unmet needs in Oregon for water infrastructure. Um, the DEQ water quality program, this is one we'll, we'll, where we will be engaging really and coordinating really closely with um, the Association of Clean Water Agencies, Aqua that, we, we, that I just mentioned. Um, this program, this item, I think is arguably one of our more important items on this list. And that's making sure that DEQ has all of the funding and resources that they need to, um, to have a robust and functional water quality permitting program. Not just getting permits issued to entities in a timely fashion, but making sure that, that the permits that they're putting out there are implementable, that they make sense for communities, and that there's tools and resources that communities need to implement those permits um, in a cost-effective way. We are bringing forward some legislation, working um, in coordination with other groups to bring forward legislation on expanding uh, recycled water reuse in Oregon. Really, that what that's going to look like is additional resources to DEQ um, to, to help them better promote water reuse projects, which can be pretty complicated to implement and administer. Um, there will be a bill um, that the Association of Clean Water Agencies is bringing forward that will provide funding for a study on PFOS. So we're gonna be closely engaging in that discussion, um, but really looking to provide some additional data and science to inform policy decisions around PFOS. Uh, local financing tools, we're gonna to be watching closely just to see if there's any legislation we impact our ability to finance infrastructure. Um, and then resilience and responsiveness, um, this one we wrote is a little bit of an open-ended to deal with things like drought, climate change, um, emerald ash borer is you're going to hear about in a bit. So we wanted to make sure that we can incorporate all those items um, where we where we need additional resource to be more resilient as a utility. And then finally, low-income water assistance funding. Uh, during 2021, the federal government for the first time approved a new program to provide funding for low-income water assistance. Um, many people are familiar with the LIHEAP program, which um, is for heating and energy. Um, that has been around for a very long time and has been pretty well funded, but there's never been a program on the water sewer side to help low income or low income individuals with their water sewer bills. So we're really excited to see that in 2021 from the federal government. Um, Oregon got about $14 million um, to administer out. And they use the network of community action agencies to get those funds out locally. 
Uh, we learned last May, however, that Washington County um, who received about just over $900,000 of those funds had already spent down their funds between February of last year and May of last year. So the need for the assistance was clearly demonstrated. Um, and basically what we are looking at now in Oregon is a program that was stood up a lot of um, time, a lot of costs went into creating this new program, and now they are essentially out of funding. So we'll be asking the state legislature to provide supplemental funding for that program. Any questions on that? Yeah, so I have a question. So assuming there's not an exhaustive list of priority programs. This actually is an exhaustive list of our state legislative agenda items that we have proactively identified that we will work on. So whether or not um, they're introduced by another entity, we will be encouraging that they are introduced and that they are part of the conversation by the state legislature. But our guiding principle is where we're going to look to, because there's going to be a whole lot of other issues that come up where we will likely engage in conversations, but these were the key items that we agreed we should work to make sure are moving forward. Okay, so follow up to that. Yes, this is an exhaustive list. Is this any order of priority or are they all same? What do you think? Not, no order of priority on this. Um, no, they're all important. Um, and again, I don't think that these will all take place necessarily in individual bills. Um, probably this list represents potentially 15 or 20 bills. So we may see resilience measures that are in, included in a number of different bills or in budgets. Um, but no, I would say not in order of priority, but I can look to Diana and Mark to see if they have any thoughts on what's what's the priority on here. DEQ's water quality permitting program is a must. It has to be funded and it has to be well funded. Interesting. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, we're pretty focused with our legislative agenda on the water issue. Now, Jerry's on the line here too, and Jerry's been really involved, for instance, in procurement or pieces like that. That's not on this list, that will be important, but that's typically being picked up by general government uh, lobbyists. Sometimes those people will come and say, hey, prevailing wage, how does that impact how you build a project, right? They provide some support there. Um, also, the history of our, particularly our state legislative agenda, has been defensive, largely. We are not introducing a lot of pieces of legislation. In fact, we're actively working on a couple this year, which is kind of unusual. It's usually kind of a defensive piece. We are very, very focused on DEQ's water quality budget. And that's very important to us. Um, local financing tools. Does anybody know what that's? That the main thing you think about there is SDCs. So that's a big issue. There could be a lot of different discussion around SDC. It's important for us from an organized uh, approach that we keep an eye on local financing tools like SDCs. So this is supposed to be narrow enough that we don't overwhelm Tracy, but broad enough that we can make her work on anything. So, <laughs> that's what I was doing, given the situation where broad want to be. Shot. What are you ready to give up? What are you ready to feel? That's really, I think, a priority is the order. So that is at least a right? like saying, okay, I don't want priorities. Typically, we're responding to bills that are being introduced. Um, so, as, as Mark suggested, a lot of it is defensive. And Tracy has peers over at uh, Washington County that are working the Washington County agenda. So we're really well tied into that, as well as the partners that she identified with SCU. And all. So we haven't had a situation where we had to, had to um, not address something. We, we, we may not have liked all of the decisions that were made that uh, we um, were engaged in. I really appreciate it. Thanks, though. And I will say we are working. So we've been working to create an internal review team um, kind of structure that's probably probably going to be mostly via email for our staff. Um, and some of our staff has already been looking at bills that we've been able to see um, as legislative concepts before they were introduced. Uh, but we're identifying those issue experts. So as I'm 
looking through 1800 plus bills. Um, I obviously don't have the technical expertise to know um, the ins and outs of maybe what should be included that wasn't included in something or um, sometimes there's an emergency clause on a bill. Um, I'm just talking to our staff in procurement and that can be really difficult where as opposed to having it be a new law in January 1st of 24, they say it, it's law as soon as it passes. And sometimes those are really easy asks to make to say, hey, can you extend that out just a little further so that we can you know, adequately prepare? So we are working internally with our staff right now as we get through that bill review process. Um, but I will say, I think I've, I've flagged probably about 70 bills that I really do want, need to take a closer look at. Um, but there's no shortage of, of bills that we have the potential to engage in either directly or again, then through those partnerships that we have with County Special District Association or Aqua. So, and that's um, so for uh, the, the session that's coming up, we've actually already, um, these items that have an asterisk indicate those bills that we've already been working on. Um, so even though the session doesn't start till next week, um, December, they had informational uh, hearings of interim committees. I was down there in December um, doing a presentation on why recycled water is so important and should be incorporated in our water management strategies and investments going forward. So we are already engaging in all of those items, whether that's um, through helping inform the drafting of the legislation, what words should be included, or helping to inform legislators um, on why these items are important. I did put a drop package up there because it looks uh, what we're hearing and, and heard from the chair of the House Ag Land Use Natural Resources and Water Committee. Um, is that there will be a pretty significant drought package this session that will be contemplated. I have no idea yet what's going to be included in that, um, but I think that there's a good chance that some resilience measures, um, as well as the potential for recycled water, um, could be folded into such a package. So we're going to be watching that really closely and already starting that conversation. Conversation. Okay, next slide. Here, Okay, so moving into federal legislative preview, as you likely know, um, have probably read in the news recently, um, Congress recently reconvened for their 118th congressional session. Um, the House has a Republican majority, while the Senate has a narrow Democratic majority. Um, we did learn in December that Congress will continue um, with direct community spending appropriations. So those are often referred to as earmarks. Um, they brought those back after about a 10 year moratorium on earmarks. Um, so they just brought them back in the last couple of years um, and have a few more sideboards for transparency sake around these types of direct spending appropriations. Um, so we did learn that um, that process will return and, and we're having conversations currently about projects that we may want to put forward um, with our federal delegation if there is an opportunity for direct um, investment and appropriation. So that's one thing um, that we'll be looking looking for. Um, in terms of our engagement at the federal level, uh, we do have a contract with a federal lobbyist. Um, so we are, are working with him, coordinating frequently, but we also engage through the National Association of Clean Water Agencies I'm on their legislative committee as well, um, and so we're meeting monthly, um, and a lot of the work that we do is really in coordination with that national association. There are other national groups that we do that with as well, a lot of reuse associations, one, for example, um, where we're providing advocacy and, and support for certain program, programmatic investments um, and other issues of priority for us. Next. So similar to, um, oh, I missed this slide, so we can move past this one or I already covered it. Um, so similar to our um, state legislative agenda, we've got broader guiding principles that will help to inform our decision making and how we engage um, in policy issues during the coming year. Um, so these items capture some of those broad areas where we do expect that we will likely engage. Um, mostly through programmatic funding and, again, letters of support for areas that we have identified as, um, as of importance to the work that we do. 
I think we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, our federal legislative priorities, again, these are the more specific items that we anticipate we will be working on, again, in close um, cooperation coordination with our federal lobbyists, um, primarily, and also some of the other national associations that I mentioned before. Um, I think most notably, probably on this list, I would say, is our work in advancing seismic safety modifications for Scoggins Dam, which I'll talk about a little bit more in depth um, in just a moment. Um, we also anticipate engaging in uh, the farm bill that will be up. That bill is up every five years for reauthorization. So we are, uh, the last time it was passed was in 2018. So let's, we know there will be a farm bill for 2023. And that will include a number of um, important uh, agricultural and conservation incentive programs um, that are really important in our region and, and for our partners as well. So do you have anything that you want to add to that, Mark, on Farm Bill? Or? <laughs> but I mean, we've got our friends here from the agricultural community, both in terms of the Fall Valley Irrigation District and obviously the Soil and Water Conservation District. So many of those. Agricultural conservation programs that advance our water quality levels are really delivered through soil water conservation district. George used to serve. So um, it's important for us, and our, it's very important for our board that we support this. And Mark and I will be spending time meeting with members of our federal delegation in the coming months to talk through this legislative agenda. We've already had. Um, one meeting in December, and we'll be setting up some additional meetings to talk through these items as they begin their work. Federally. So, um, before I jump um, into kind of more detail on Scoggins Dam, I think it's important to note the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill that was passed in 2021, as it does actually have an input, impact on our work on Scoggins. Um, that bill represented the single largest investment in water infrastructure in U.S. history. So it was incredibly exciting to see Congress was able to pull together that package and get it over the, the full line. Um, we saw a lot of important uh, key water um, related funding investments in there, including for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, so we are currently having conversations here at the district about how we may engage in that increase um, funding that we are expecting to see, which will flow to the state through the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, so it's really an exciting time. Um, there are a number of requirements that do attach to that federal funding. So we're really trying to think strategically about where it makes the most sense for us to um, engage in which projects would be the best ones for us to seek out that potential federal funding assistance. So any questions on that that's kind of going it through quickly. I will note that um, in past years um, for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, we've typically seen um, mostly loans through that program, um, which do tend to have really competitive interest rates, but ultimately do have to be paid back by the entity. Um, with this new package, they are requiring at least 49% of the funds to be administered um, via principal forgiveness, which operates pretty similarly to a grant. Um, so we are working through that process, trying to understand from DEQ how they're going to prioritize which projects receive that principal forgiveness funding. Um, but it really does change, I think, the nature of the attractiveness of that program. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more Oregon entities that are, are really taking a close look at that opportunity going forward. Next. Um, okay, so in terms of um, Mark can jump into this, but uh, do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah, I'll go and do these next couple of slides. <laughs> and probably do some slides too. So Scoggins Sam is a federal facility, right? It's been very central to our ability to be water that we have stored behind that facility. It was built, constructed in 1975, 76, when it was completed. 151 foot tall earthen dam. That's if you look up Scoggins Valley, right? Those ponds you see there is Stimson Lumber. Uh, and then you could see the dam itself behind that. 
Um, it is the region's primary water source, right? It's our primary drinking water source. Uh, it is it is uh, the agricultural water source, and it's a water quality source. Um, Bureau of Reclamation has about 350 facilities in 17 Western states, right? It's a federal agency that only works in the West. Of all the storage facilities in the U.S. that they manage, this is the only facility in the country that has water quality as a project. So this was constructed in 1975 for the project purposes. One was uh, irrigated agriculture. One was municipal and industrial. Of water, drinking water, and one of something called pollution abatement, water quality water. So we're a bit of an uh, odd duck there. We release water from that facility uh, typically beginning, used to be July 1st, now it's getting earlier and earlier as summer comes earlier, uh, when to maintain a base flow of 12. So we have target flows. Jamie, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. She's actually the person who's typically trying to put targets for us. And releasing water, and we release water at Allen and Trump Valley Irrigation District. And he's got his his patrons that are releasing water. So that this is a really it's a fabulous investment that's been made in this region. The next page, please. So, in the early two thousands, this region did something called the Integrated Water Resource Management Strategy to look at how we plan for long term water supply. How we balance the sometimes competing needs there, and as many of you are probably aware, in the early 2000s, there was a federal law that was passed to do a water supply feasibility study, jointly funded by the federal government and by local water supply partners. At that time, it was Hillsborough and Twelve Valley Water District and uh, Clean Water Services, and to a certain degree, Forest Grove as well, and the City of Beaverton. Look at what, how do we get our next increment of water supply? We went through that process. Um, the, the proposal was to basically raise the dam to make it taller. Um, in about 2009, 2010, during a regular assessment of this particular facility by the federal government, they said that it was susceptible to cascading subduction zone, so deformation in a, in a large earthquake. Um, they did some additional studies on it in 2012 in a decision document that, in fact, was never signed, but it did say that this was the most seismically threatened facility or among the most seismically threatened facilities in the Bureau of Reclamation's inventory. Okay? It's earthen. It's also super close to the coast, right? It is. It's just, just right over the hill from the coast. So it's very susceptible to an earthquake. About that time, the drinking water folks decided this is too long of a game, they're going to go to Google Land. So, you know, that's all the traffic we get to go around all over the place. Is that when we'll have a water supply project that's coming up here? Clean Water Services still needed, uh, felt that that water was important. So we moved forward in a joint project. Uh, Senators Merkley and Senator White introduced a particular piece of legislation in 2016, so before that, 2015, to um, allow a joint project. We can bring our money federal government will bring their dam safety money. The inter interesting thing is once this cat went into the dam safety program, um, it's very generous, it's 85% federal, 15% local. You don't see cost shares like that in very many places. I think that's really a reflection that your regulation works with a lot of agricultural communities across the West, and there's a lot of support for ag. So we were gonna bring our money for an enlarged facility, they'd bring their dam safety money um, we went through an analysis of that over, correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, probably five years with Bureau of Reclamation to look at a number of different options. You all might have seen them downstream dam, making the dam bigger. Ultimately, when the cost estimates came out in 2019, the downstream dam was about $1.4 billion. And it was just beyond the capacity, the rate capacity for clean water services to do that. Concurrent with that, I, I look at our regulatory affairs folks back there like Jamie, doing some careful modeling on what our long-term regulatory needs are. We release this water to offset thermal impacts, right? And for over effluent that we release to the river. Um, the additional water was not gonna meet all of our needs. So even if we got more water, we're still going to have to do something else. So in 29, 
2021, working with our board, we made the decision to do dam safety only. So we're no longer involved in this project other than 15% of everything the federal government does, does is to be paid by Allen's patrons and um, clean water services rate payers and the, and the drinking water rate payers in this region. So that's kind of where we were. One of the things that's nice is this project is among the highest priorities within the Bureau of Reclamation Dam Safety Program. Our biggest concern is if we're number we, if we're number three on the list, I think we are probably number three on the list. We don't want to be number three forever. We want to be number two eventually, and then number one, and that takes a lot of effort. There. The federal bipartisan infrastructure bill pushed a lot of money into the dam safety program to accelerate projects, particularly projects that's in front of the sales campaign. So there's another slide. Oh, and Elaine, thank you. Jody is here making sure that we see your hand, Elaine. So please. Hey, thank you. Um about Scoggins Dam, I'm curious because I I'm thinking about kind of three intertwining issues here. It's my understanding that the Tualatin water rights are over allocated already. Um, we have issues of, for example, Kincaid's Lupin occurring up near Hag Lake possibly Northwestern pond turtles, which are a candidate for listing as endangered. Um, and then also I'm really interested in the water reuse legislative agenda that clean water has. I don't know if this time and place is the best place for me to kind of come up to speed on these things, but I am really interested in whether the water reuse initiative could help relieve some pressure. I don't expect it to get rid of the issue of needing to raise the dam for Hag Lake, but I'm just curious about the interplay of all those issues and how I, as a advisory committee member might be able to educate myself at least and maybe even be helpful in some way. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, good questions and I'll answer a little bit of them and then absolutely I think we have to sit down and talk about this a little bit. One is what's moving forward with Scoggins Dam now is they are we will no longer be increasing the size of it. The dam will no longer be taller. We're not going to build a downstream dam. What is happening right now is basically a seismic uh, improvement, seismic modification to the tune of, uh, it, it's a, I think the 2019 estimate was $775 million of federal funding that will be coming to Washington County um, in the next 10 years, most likely. Uh, Kinkin's Lupin, really, really good question. That was discovered actually during some of the work that Clean Water Services was doing when we were looking at expansion of that facility and have proactively worked for seed uh, collection there to look at what the mitigation might be, but that now will, will not be impacted by, well, maybe impacted by the borrower. So I don't know. That would be interesting to know with the environmental impact statement. And then the last thing I'll touch on briefly, and we can talk about this more later, our plan B, since we did not get the extra water here, is really at a, a very large expansion of water reuse by clean water services. So how do we take our water and that's warm and provide it to for uh, irrigation and for other purposes, but primarily for irrigation, keep that out of the, out of the river. So that's a start, Elaine, and I'd be happy to talk about that offline or be further as well. So to move forward where we are right now, Scott and Sam, this has been our number one federal legislative priority for 20 years. I, I should be a million mile flyer for the number of times I've been to Washington, D.C. on this um, over the last 20 years. It's really changed now. Really, our focus is on supporting the safety dance program together with Fall Valley Irrigation District, uh, cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, and Forest Grove. Those are the five repayment partners. Those are the five entities that will have the local 15% responsibility. 
Um, we continue to work with a, a legislature. It's a priority for certainly for Senator Berkeley and for Senator Wyden. We secured some congressional report language in last year's appropriation bill. Continue to emphasize the support of this project even as a basis in terms of achieving what we've been told by reclamation for project time right on a slide right now is they are hoping to complete the environmental impact statement for the dam safety in 2023-2024. They do something called the safety of dams modification report, which goes through con through the office of management and budget and then construction in 2028, completed in 2024. Uh, I've always been a proponent of constant pressure constantly applied in terms of, of, of these types of projects. We don't want people to forget that this is our primary water source. So this is kind of, it's probably more detailing than you get on any other legislative thing, but we've been pretty deeply enmeshed in this. And it is a central asset for how we manage clean water services. It is really, really Any questions there? Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back to. I think the next slide says questions. So oh, questions! <laughs> yes, no, happy to take any questions on either state, or federal. Yeah. I have some that are just kind of random here. So when you talk about the grant and low income federal programs, there seems to be an ongoing discussion or it's on the news about Jackson, Mississippi, and their. Or many billions of dollars they're getting. Are there any any uh, entities in Oregon that you're aware of that might be facing that same kind of financial situation and all the overall system neglect for eons that's going to pop up here someday? And I mean, I I think the answer is. Probably yes, to the extent that what of what we saw in Jackson, Mississippi. I hope not. Um, I feel like challenge and concern that you see with a lot of those big stories is that people don't know there's a crisis. And know there's a crisis. Um, but I do know when I was working at Lake Morgan City, so we still have wood pipes in parts of the part of the state um, that, that our utilities know that if they touch them, they're going to disintegrate. So they just kind of leave them alone. We do have a lot of infrastructure that is has been long neglected. And you know, I think right now one of the big challenges um, in conversations with the state legislature um, is for those communities, especially city of Newport was one, they've got a dam that is very seismically threatened. And the last um, price takes I saw on that were 60 to $80 million for a community that doesn't have a population that can afford that investment. And I think that's one of the big challenges in conversations is uh, the price tag I think is just simply too large for certain communities. I think most communities are kind of feeling that pressure right now um, and, and just figuring out. And the federal investment used to be about 70% um, back when the Clean Water Act passed. Um, so that was a long time ago, but it has just continually decreased over time. So now it's on state and it's on local rate payers primarily to invest in that infrastructure. And I think we're starting to see a lot of um, a lot of that come to fruition in terms of stress um, where water affordability conversations come into play um, and concerns about whether water rates are affordable for our, all Oregonians um, and how you balance that investment that you have to make in the infrastructure with concerns that you want to make sure everybody is able to pay that water bill going forward, which I think points back to why that low income water rate assistance program um, was really an important step in a direction because you've got infrastructure investment up front to offset that potential cost to the ratepayers, but then for those existing investments where you've got ratepayers that can't afford that, of making sure that there's a safety net there. Does Clean Water Services have a have their own program to deal with the sewer portion of you know that shows up on low income bills? You don't run your own. Your own program to help with sewer bills only? So that's an interesting question because of the past, the past board did not um, implement a clean water services component of the customer assistance program. However, through COVID, we were able to secure um, ARPA money to be able to start that. There is an ongoing conversation with the cities because the cities have programs 
we're looking at the program that the state is offering and the federal government to see if we can get a wrap around program. So that would come to CWAC as a policy discussion and um, what clean water services could do for that. Good. So we're living on ARPA money right now, right? Yeah. With the uh, redistricting in Oregon, we now have six districts. So did we just add a level of complexity to your to your assignment here that you now have senators and three reps to deal with instead of two of each? I don't know if Gannon's going to add complexity, but Mark and I were just talking about that, that we need to reach out to our new person, uh, Selena, to meet with her, sit down, brief her on issues. Um, I don't know that it adds necessarily another level of complexity in some ways. I would say more people caring about Scoggins is a good thing. Um, so, but we will need to be doing some extra engagement and just education uh, with, with the new neighbor. So. Yeah, it, is, it is interesting that, you know, previously it was Representative Bonniche and Senator White and Marco was the only three. Now with Representative Salinas, who has, you're probably in your district. Yeah, right. Our house is right kind of on the border there. Just barely into her district. Yeah. So, so all of a sudden we have another federal representative that has a portion of the Twilight Basin. Does she know that Hague Lake's a federal facility that's threatened and serves her customers? I don't know. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to have to um, I've always kind of been in my years of lobbying in Washington, D.C., I've been a little envious of California because you know, they had like 45, 49 representatives, right? In a market at five. So having a Additional people that care about it is, is not, not bad. Well, especially if you can get the other ones to, if the if they will vote as a as an Oregon group, why we got one more vote. Yeah. Okay, one last question, just on the reservoirs at uh, Egg Lake and Barney Reservoir, are they filling on on schedule? You know, it's interesting. Absolutely. Uh, did you notice, sorry? Yes, they're totally, in fact, they were above the fill curve. Jamie, Jamie, who manages a lot of the shooting, why don't you answer that question? Yes, they are. Yeah, they are above the fill curve. We just need to get an update from you. Yeah, they're ahead of schedule. Okay. So, and you, you'll appreciate this from um, time working for the city of Twilight Zone. So, you're the city engineer, is that right? But Mike was a peer of ours, right, in the public works community, and obviously, well, it's a place that floods sometimes. Um, they're in a situation for a while there where they were releasing a lot more water than the next country. They were way above the floor. Set down by the capacity for January and February. So you'd have 200 cubic feet per second coming in, and they'd be releasing 600 cubic feet. Yeah, I was actually just by the dam tip there at, at Scotland that they were going to release the last couple of weeks after that big storm event that we had just to get back down. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just a few minutes if there's any other questions. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time tonight and so I wish me a lot. Charge barricades. Yeah. Thank you for some hard reading. Okay, our next agenda item is managing emerald ash borer impacts that Jill has. Well, thanks everybody for letting us take some of your time. There'll be uh, four of us speaking tonight. Us up to the uh, mound so we can talk about some of this. Um, my name is Robert Emanuel. I'm a natural uh, natural systems project manager, so I manage uh, all kinds of restoration projects. I also have a background in botany and ecology, and I also tend to our integrated pest management program, which is a component of our surface water surface water management permit. So. Something that's related to predators and pests that we have problems with, and how we treat them and deal with them uh, in ways that are careful of our water quality and our 
communities. Um, so we're going to talk about a uh, new uh, critter that has made its way into the basin tonight. And our goal here is to give you a basic education about what Emerald Ash Borer is. And we'll also talk to you about some of the impacts of that um, particular insect on trees that are part of our uh, thermal load program. So our thermal load management program, very important component to how we manage the quality of the river, and the quality of the water bodies that also contribute to the Twelves River. So uh, Jamie my, uh, Hughes, my colleague in regulatory affairs, will be talking about uh, that, that program in that context. And then Randy Lawrence will also be giving us a discussion of how Emerald Ash Borer will impact or not impact that particular piece of our Work. And then lastly, Jill Erickson, our division manager and stewardship will follow up with how we're going to respond to this as a district and kind of as a community. Now. So let me start off by giving you a quick introduction to this little guy. This is the emerald ash borer. It's a very small insect, not something that you would see every day. It's about the size of a penny in terms of its it, it, at the diameter of a penny. It's not necessarily penny shaped. It's long and thin. It's a beautiful emerald green uh, set of covers or elytra that sit on the back of this insect and cover up its wings. Uh, these are strong flyers. They're, they will fly somewhere between uh, 100 feet to four miles, depending on how energetic they are when they're moving about. And they only emerge for a couple of weeks, like a lot of insects, um, out of their whole life cycle. The rest of their life cycle is spent inside tunneling under the bark of trees. Primarily, those trees are ash trees, and we'll talk about why that's important for the Tualatin River and, and, and ultimately for much of the West Coast of the U.S. Um, these were found living in some trees in Joseph Gale Elementary School and also at Joseph Gale Park in Forest Grove. So they were located by around June 30th by a uh, colleague of mine who works for the city of Portland. And he was picking up his kids from camp and he saw some trees that were struggling. And he and I have collaborated on um, presentations along with others um, to uh, educate ourselves, our fellow ecologists and botanists about Emerald Ash Borer. And so he looked at these trees and he said, oh, these kind of look like they have the signs and the symptoms of Emerald Ash Borer. Let me go get out of my, my car while my kids are still coming out of the school and take a look. And indeed, he found, you know, proof positive. And then while he was standing there, he was examining them. One of his kids came up and said, what are you looking at, Dad? And he said, I'm looking for Emerald Ash Borer. And he's like, oh, is that one of these? And he held up the insect. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so... We, we got lucky, found the insect, and we also confirmed its signs and symptoms in these trees. Unfortunately, these trees have been infested with this insect for anywhere between two and six years. Um, the insects live in the bark of trees, and I'll talk about what that really does to the tree, but it takes them a long time to manifest with signs and symptoms. Sort of like when we get sick, it takes us a few days to show the symptoms of the cold or the flu that we got. Um, Emerald ash borer takes a little while to do its work in the uh, cambium of these trees. And so it will take them a while to start to show those signs and symptoms. And because they spend a majority of their life cycle living underneath the bark of these trees, you don't see them. So the infestation has been here a little while and they're low density, meaning there's not a lot of these insects um, out and about. And there are very few trees infested, but we have found around 256 trees in the Forest Grove region that have confirmed evidence of emerald ash borer. So we know there's a big bullseye right now on the Forest Grove region. Um, let's talk about their life cycle. So just to give you some biology, emerald ash borer has a life cycle that needs uh, ash trees in particular to complete. So in their native uh, countries of, of Korea, the Korean Peninsula, China, Japan, Russia, they need to uh, live underneath the bark of ash trees that are already stressed, that have other issues. And so they will come in, like many uh, forest insects, 
and they'll kind of predate those trees that have been most impacted by something else. It could be an injury, it could be a lightning strike, whatever it is, the tree is already going down, it's already sick. And so they come in and they kind of tend to finish it off. It's sort of part of that uh, almost decomposer cycle of life if you think about you know, something working, uh, fungi working on the bottom of, of a dug fir, for example. So these are similar to that. However, they have escaped from their uh, home range and they've made it into Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan uh, first found these insects in a port and neighboring trees near a port in 2002 and in Windsor, Canada, the twin port. And since then, the insects have uh, spread to 36 other states. So they spread very quickly. They fly relatively far, but they're kind of lazy. They'll tend to move from tree to tree. So if you have large groves of ash trees, they will move from ash to ash in order to find an acceptable place to lay eggs. Um, the adults emerge in the summertime. They kind of fly around, they eat a little bit, get some energy, they mate, and then they very quickly go lay their eggs in an existing ash tree. The ash tree will start to uh, produce hormones and things sap to push the insect out, but it's usually too late. The insects start to tunnel throughout there. And as they tunnel, what they will do is essentially uh, remove the uh, cambium layer, the layer that moves water and nutrients back and forth from up, up the top of the tree down to the roots, they'll girdle it and remove that material. And so eventually you get these um, uh, what we call S-shaped galleries, which you can see on the upper right there. And those galleries are evidence of the insects moving and boring through the wood. Um, and then the tree starts to produce all these extra growth around the base and starts to die off at the top as it's struggling to try to get nutrients and water and eventually it dies out completely. In the East Coast and in the Midwest where the Emerald Ash Border was first established, unfortunately it killed 99% of the trees that it encountered. North American ash species, there are many. Um, we only have one here in this state that is native, that is the Oregon ash. They are very susceptible to this insect. So why do we care about this? We care about this because they impact trees that primarily grow along streams and rivers. These are trees that are primarily found. Oregon ash is a very important riparian species. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those um, uh, species that are found in riparian areas are principal producers of shade and habitat and influence the water quality to a great degree. Many of our Willamette Valley forests along streams are composed of anywhere between 20 and, and 80 percent ash trees. So having these trees uh, impacted by an insect is a big deal. Um, EAB can spread very quickly. Emerald ash borer, we, we tend to shortcut its name to EAB. Uh, it spreads very quickly because it will move from tree to tree and it will infest a whole grove. So if you have a riparian area that has a large uh, component of ash, it will move quickly through that. It's sort of similar to what we've all unfortunately become used to in terms of um, uh, this pandemic period, the transmission of viruses, for example. So as those things have moved, as these insects move through populations of trees, many of the trees become infected. Uh, lastly, because it spreads from ash tree to ash tree, it will move very quickly along river systems, it will tend to eventually move from the Tualatin Basin to the Willamette, and from the Willamette, it will go to the Columbia, and from Columbia uh, to some of the tributaries. Thank you so much. I had a bottle of water with me. So this is a big impact. It will alter uh, riparian forests, and it will also alter wetlands. We have many wetlands in the state that are dominated by ash trees. Ash trees uh, compose a major habitat type that we call ash forested wetland or forested wetland. So those two habitat types, riparian areas, long streams, and wetlands will be the principal places impacted. And so I'm gonna hand this off now to Jamie to talk about uh, water quality trading and what's going on with that. And then we'll relate it back to the Emerald Ash Borer. Thanks, Rob. Sure. Okay. So I'm Jamie Hughes. I'm in our regulatory affairs department at Clean Water Services. I'm going to provide you a little background on the trading programs to sort of set you up for the discussion about the Emerald Ash Borer and the impacts that it might have on our trading program. Shade, the riparian planting element of our program. 
So, um, um, for some background, we have very strict thermal load and temperature limits as part of our permit. Um, Clean Water Services, before we decided to go with a trading program, we looked at several different options for meeting those thermal load limits. One of them was um, reducing the influent, thermal load influent to our treatment facilities um, through looking at working with industries to install chillers and things like that. However, there's not a lot of huge industries that discharge a lot of them load to our treatment plants. So it wouldn't provide that option alone wouldn't provide enough uh, thermal load reduction to issues. Um, we also looked at removing the discharge from our treatment facilities the Tualatin River entirely, either through implementing recycled water to the point where we're no longer discharging, or through removing the discharge to the Tualatin River completely, moving to discharge into the Willamette or to the Columbia Rivers. Obviously, that's going to be an issue because our effluent in the summertime and early fall make up about 50 to 75 percent of the flow in the river. So if we remove that, obviously, there's going to be flow and quality issues. Like so that option. We also looked at um, um, recycled water, that's another option that will help, um, you know, reducing our thermal loads. And then, um, so we ended up going with, we also looked at installing uh, either chillers or refrigeration units at our treatment facilities, sort of a technology-based approach. Those are obviously very expensive options. We're looking at $100 million in capital costs for installing a refrigeration unit and several million dollars a year in uh, operating costs. So cost expensive approach also doesn't really benefit watershed health. We ended up going with water quality trading, which is a pretty cost effective approach and also also have these ancillary benefits as well. So we do have conditions in our permit now that allow us to offset the thermal loads from our treatment facilities using trading. There are two different elements to our trading program. There's the flow enhancement element, which we talked about briefly, and I'll add a little bit more to that in a second. And then there's our repairing planting program element, which is more directly tied to the electrical the impacts from that. The permit requires that we have a thermal load management plan that sort of summarizes how we how we implement our thermal load um, activities, our repairing planting and enhancement activities. There's two components to that. There's a thermal reduction component and a trading component. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that trading for temperature is pretty unique to the Pacific Northwest. You look at the Midwest, for example, you'll hear more about trading for nutrients because of all the agricultural activity area. However, here we have these very sensitive salmon species that have different temperature thresholds that they need for rearing and spawning and migration, depending on the time of year. And we also have um, a fairly large discharge to a fairly small river. So that's something that those are the issues that we're having to deal with here in the West, and specifically at Clean Water Services. That's why trading for, for temperature is something that you'll only hear about, or is you're more likely to hear about here than a couple. So I mentioned that our thermal load management plan has two different components. One is this thermal load reduction piece, where we are trying to, to reduce our thermal loads from our water resource recovery facilities as much as we can. So that's doing things like I mentioned, source control. We have worked with some industries to install chillers. Others, for example, have installed chillers, which help reduce the thermal load that's coming to our treatment plants. Um, we've looked at recycled water as another option. That's something that has helped us reduce our thermal loads. Um, doing treatment plant facility improvements, things like covering aeration basins and adding heat loop exchanges, things that have also helped to reduce our thermal loads and we're continuing to look at options to do that at our treatment plants. And then um, implementing the Fernhill Natural Treatment System. That has provided reductions in thermal and anything that we can't reduce at our treatment of plants or through source control or things like that, that's what we use. We offset the remaining thermal loads to offset that with our trading program, which is both made up of flow enhancement and riparian planting. So the flow enhancement piece is what Mark and Tracy were talking about earlier, where we release in the summertime between May and October pool stored water from both Pad Lake and Barney Reservoir. And then there's a calculation that's done calculating credits for the amount. We also do a riparian planting program where we plant vegetation along streams and tributaries. We get credit that shade that those vegetations provide. So here are some of the elements of the trading program. I mentioned we generate credits based on the shade that is provided by the vegetation that we plant. 
that's looking at a 20 year, assuming a 20 year life cycle or a 20 year time frame for that vegetation to mature and provide the shade. Um, we have a model at DEQ, it's called heat source or shade layer model that takes all these different um, input criteria, things like aspects of the project in relation to the sun, incision of area, stream uh, density, things like that, and it calculates what the effective shade or the thermal load block is going to be in 20 years. Um, as part of that, we have to make sure we are accounting for training baseline. What are the baseline conditions when you your project or when you're planting your vegetation. That way we're only taking credit for the vegetation that we plant and not, not what's already existing. Um, we also have to apply a two to one ratio. This accounts for that time lag, that 20 year time difference. So we're getting 50% of the credit for the shade that is provided by the projects that we we have a significant monitoring and verification component as part of our training, our repairing planting program, where we go out and we conduct a biannual monitoring, monitoring at all of our projects. We do shade monitoring every five years um, just to make sure our projects are on track. They are providing the target stem densities we're looking at. They're providing the sh anticipated shade that we've projected. And we do have a product, uh, process for you know, interplanting and doing things to make sure that they're staying on that. We have a, also reporting that we do to DEQ um, every year and as well as monthly. Put together, you know, the calculation of the credits showing that we're offsetting our thermal loads for both from flow and from our riparian planting. And then one thing I want to note is that in our last permit, we had a condition that required us to retire 5% of the credits that we generated from our credit portfolio. So at the end of our permit, five year permit renewal cycle, we had to delete like 5% of the credits. This was something that EPA had put into our permit the last time around when they objected to the This time around in this 22 permit, 2022 permit that just got issued 11 days ago, this condition is no longer there. So we do not have to retire 5% of the credits. That's a good thing. <clears throat> well, I think yeah. it's really yeah. noticeable. Along these things are all really new to me. So I don't stand. These metrics and units for thermal credits and the fraction of the uh, Fahrenheit or you look at kilocalories per day. That's how we're Cal talking Cal about credits. It's like a eight below. <coughs> um, yeah. Does that relate to the volume of water that's discharged also? So the, the calculation of flow enhancement credits, that's looking at a regression equation. So we do look at you know the rate of water that we're discharging throughout the summertime. Um, and then the, the different flows at each of, there's there's different target flows that Mark had mentioned that I'm trying to make sure I meet above each of the treatment facilities. So we're looking at these regression equations to calculate what that temperature is going to be. Yeah, it's sort of complicated. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, I look at which two, there's also the calculation of how many kilocalories per square foot of shade, right? For, for there's, there's the calculation. Spatial of component to it. Lots of like it's, it's summarized on the segment of street, about 100 foot segment of street. Kilocalorie amount that's credited offset. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's different for the recreation planning program versus the flow program. That's using the regression equation and the planting program. Uh, we have our uh, NSCS and the Natural Systems Group who delineate each of our projects at like 35 foot. And um, you get a code that comes out of that, like based on height of shade, that gets plugged into this model and calculates the effective shade provided in each of those segments. Okay. Yeah, it's complicated. Going through all this, can you measure any noticeable change in the temperature of the water? So we're not actually looking at temperature specifically. Um, looking at lower load blocks when you're looking at riparian planting, riparian planting. So. <clears throat> I should have asked you a question. Thank you for asking. 
Shade over the top of it, right? Now. It's better to measure the shade that's there than to try to measure what is just flowing by. <clears throat> you know, I was trying to think how many years has the uh, Clean Water been involved with the Soil and Water District on the Enhanced Prep pro Program? Has that been about 15 years? Yeah. Rich, yeah, since 2005. Okay. Um, is are you are you seeing any response from that? You know, and you've got 15 years of growth on that. Then we've got global warming. Is that going to be offsetting the shade that uh, that your temperature you're gaining? We are looking at planting different types of plant species that are more resilient to climate change. That's something that taking into account. Um, we are also seeing I mean, we've seen major impacts from 15 years of planting in trees. We can tell that there's Difference. We've gone out and we actually just went to a DQ last fall where we took them to some of these projects that showed significant change, significant shade canopy provided. Yeah, you can definitely tell the difference. And we even see that in the LIDAR data when we look at GIS. You can see now and 15 years ago that change in canopy height. So, but one thing I wanted to point out here, and George brought this up, George previously served on. The advisory commission 2000 2008 something like that um this commission was really central and particularly the work of, of folks like agricultural reps like george in terms of putting together how the trading program was set up and how because we implement a lot of that <clears throat> trading program through the summer so uh, the, the, the rental rates that were set up through all those things were really designed by some I think it was 2006 or something. Does that sound about right, Rich? Uh, maybe a few years earlier. I think the first eco project was five. So, yeah, I think it was the stream protection opportunities like SOTAC uh, that met for a couple of years, 2000s, that led and culminated with the Washington. Okay. Underlying principle is that clean water services would have had to have installed chillers at the end of the treatment. So we would have had to spend probably $250 million on that action. But when you put a chiller on a treatment plant, you're just cooling the water several hundred feet down from the treatment plant. Okay. So we knew that the better investment is to invest in the watershed itself, to get better health of a watershed. So that was the underlying principle of why Clean Water Services wanted to invest in uh, thermal trading and to invest with the agricultural community with the e program. We know we could do more uh, with that $250 million than just putting a chiller on the end. What's cycling back in 2023 is the fact that the treatment plant effluent itself is rising in temperature that we can't offset it anymore with the water that comes from Hag Lake or uh, the thermal trading program. So that's what we're trying to manage right now to get the temperature down at the treatment plants and water reuse um, offers that opportunity because we can take that warm water and we can irrigate with it. And it's a great water source that helps during drought conditions. So, but that fundamental principle that people way before me did Right under the general manager Bill Gaffey, kind of a CWAC at the time, was so forward thinking. Because guess what? We would have put a chiller in, we would be back having to expand that chiller, electrical costs, and really it wouldn't have done anything for the river. So that was so wise, George, <laughs> way back when. Well, CREP program was a was a federal program that for some reason, farmers in Washington County or in a certain part of the state um, did not embrace because the uh, rental rates were so low. The value of the land was so high. 
but uh, with the enhanced portion that clean water contributed, that, that we had a lot of farmers sign up for that. It's important. It's important to recognize that. Thank you. That's exactly right, Chuck. What the dis the policy decision that was made there by our board is we're taking urban sewer ratepayer dollars and we're sending them to farmers. Pretty innovative idea because there was a recognition that the investment there was going to be less expensive and provide a lot more output. But that was a it was kind of a brave decision the board made at that time in the early 2000s to do that, but it was through the support of, of the commission and stuff. And also, what is the temperature of the discharge from the plants? Already I'm getting up to 71 degrees, 72 degrees. Well, I mean, I heard it's 77, and every now and then it gets up that high. Really? Every night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's the, the temperature of the river, the baseline kind of? Well, it's like now, what's the temperature of the river today? That's a good question. It's cold. <laughs> yes. And That's temperature. Yeah. Way below that. Yeah. But the limit we have is. 77, 25 degrees. Well, in the summertime, the river is the river cooler than the plants in the summer. The river is warmer than our water in the summer. The summer. So it's really it's a policy for water quality to preserve the salmon species, nature species. And how can we do that in a way that makes the most economic sense? gets the best value. So that's why this uh, watershed based approach is so important for our region. And um, we are asking our industrial customers to help with their hot water discharges. And we do need uh, to put a whole series of actions in place so that we don't hit that thermal limit of the plants itself. And that's why water reuse is going to Is the discharge temperature be consistent all year long? It has some variations, but it's really impacted. You know, there's some cooling that happens because the sewer is so deep, right? It's underground. So there's some heat exchange, but um, it's fairly consistent. It's a little cooler in the winter time, um, but it's really, you know, part of the monocle water showers we take. We even had a, a team member had a crazy idea. We need sort of a cold water shower challenge. <laughs> In, in the basin, but you know, <laughs> we love hot water. This way. Yeah, I know <laughs> we love hot water, right? For our laundry, for our clothes, and everything that we do. But it's really finding that balance. And your climate change question is so right on because at a certain point, the, the salmon species are going to struggle even more. What is it that we want and what do we choose? So we're trying to show that. With our actions, the salmon species, they do better by, you know, opening up bomb growth, right? Getting rid of the dam, letting the fish get all the way up to the upper parts of the watershed. So trying to be very practical to get the best bang for the best species. But that action way back then is visionary here. So we're lucky. Uh, the folks um, that came before us and now with all of you, I'm hoping we're going to take that same visionary action so people 20 years from now see uh, what we did to navigate these challenges. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for serving us. Yeah. 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 So, I should um, So, it sounds like there's not a rule or like a law or something that uh, the industry has been discharge hot water have to put on chillers? This is like a voluntary thing? So we met, so with our industries, um, they have a pretreatment permit to discharge to the sanitary sewer system. So they work with us on all sorts of water quality parameters. So temperature is one, they have um, metals and, and all sorts of different parameters. It's regulated by the federal government under the federal uh, government's 403 standards, but it's also we have a local overlay as to what our treatment standards are because of our treatment plant and, and where we uh, recycle uh, biosolids. 
it's a it's a very formalized program in which we work with other industries and we've been very lucky here they work on very closely with joy who ramirez is on the on the by phone here but we can talk about that of what the free treatment program is we'll be hearing more presentations so we've kind of wound a path down something other than our primary focus yeah, here. Yeah. But I, I really appreciate the time. I'm sorry. Good. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Um, it, it's really good and to link those pieces together. So let me keep asking those questions. I'm going to hand it back to Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is this slide shows all of the regular and planting projects that are enrolled in the trading program. So we have. 161 projects. You can tell they're both in rural areas with the ECREP program and back program, and they're also in the urban areas with our capital program. Um, total, I think it's about 85 stream miles that we uh, planted for Therian planting as well, um, which generated over 1,100 million kilocalories per day of credit. So <laughs> that's how we calculated. Um, so yeah, I want to note that this 161 projects is not all of the riparian planting projects that Clean Water Services has done. It's just the ones that have been enrolled in the trading program. But there are going to be more enrolled going forward. Do you have any nonprofits and other local groups involved in this? Just do it all by us. Oh no, we work with all sorts of all sorts of groups. Now I'll turn it over to Randy to talk about the Amarillo Network. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Um, my name is Randy Lawrence. I'm in the Natural Systems Department in the Stewardship Division. Uh, we in the Stewardship Division do a lot of things, um, but one of the key things is that we take care of these projects when um, they're older. Um, we call it in stewardship phase, but you can think of it like maintenance. Um, in our permit, we maintain credit for these projects as long as we maintain function. Um, and so we're really interested in maintaining function for the long term to maintain that credit and making that function resilient. So that shade resilient to impacts like Emerald Ash Floor. Um, this is a map again of all, all of our projects. The, the little green polygons on there are ones that we've planted ash on. The gray ones are where we've monitored and found ash. All of our projects have ash on them. Um, so clearly EAB is a big concern to us, um, but we don't think there's a significant impact to our shade credit. Um, and so the next several slides, I'm going to tell you why we think that. Um, I don't want that to overshadow the fact that it is going to be a huge impact ecologically to the county or watershed and Oregon. Um, but the way we've done shade credit so far, um, it will likely not suffer a huge impact to our actual credit. Um, so first to understand the spread, right now it's in Forest Grove, um, and this is a reconstruction of what happened in Detroit or near Detroit. Um, so it actually got there probably in the mid nineties, 2002 is when they discovered it. And it spread from there and it spreads on this uh, left side. You can see a lot like a wildfire. So there's the initial infestation and these satellites grow and then they merge and then new satellites form and so on. Um, and it's kind of exponential over time. Um, these ones on the right, uh, it's all in kilometers, but um, they show how quickly this initial infestation spread. Um, and so there's two, two things to think about. It's that initial colony and the radius of that thing, how quickly it, it expands. Um, it's that um, these blue boxes show where we think we are. Um, in terms of that infestation, we'd be between two and five kilometers um, in radius. And then there's these satellites. Um, so the bugs that really fly far. So Rob mentioned that Mostly they stay close, but there's a couple that fly really far, and that's one of the reasons it's always been impossible to contain. It's been tried many times and failed every time. Um, and that could be as far as 60 kilometers from the initial infestation. So uh, kilometers, I don't really know how far a kilometer is, to be honest, um, but that's you know what the scientists do. So I drew some circles and lines to show you guys. So these two circles, that's a two and five kilometer radius circle. So far, all of the positive identifications have been inside that inner circle within two kilometers in Forest Grove. Everything's within the city limits. There's probably ones that they just haven't found. It's really, really hard to find, like Rob mentioned, when it's early. Um, so when the bugs fly and they're in the top of a tree. Um, so that five kilometer circle, they're likely there. So in Cornelius, north and south of Forest Grove. 
Um, but there's satellites um, that could be as far as 60 kilometers away. Um, we don't have 60 kilometers in our county, right, before you wrap it uh, from Forest Grove, from Joe Gale. So what that means is there's a good chance that there are bugs throughout the county. Um, it's not definite, but um, I think it's important for anybody in the county, land managers, jurisdictions, street tree managers, whoever, um, to start thinking about EAB and start thinking about how they're going to manage the impacts to their property, uh, their investments, and so on. Uh, so mortality. This is the invasion curve that we see within our dashboard. Um, and those two red arrows are where we think we are again here uh, between three and six years or so, or two and uh, four years is what I put on here. But um, it's, it's hard to really estimate the, um, the trees we found um, may not be the first. They're just the first we know of. Um, so we're on the beginning of this really steep curve of the emerald ash borer density increase. Um, and then that's followed by ash mortality. Um, so far in other American ash populations, that's been near 100%. Um, and we expect it to be the same um, in Oregon ash based on trials that were done um, back east, as well as the fact that Oregon ash trees are the ones that have been infested and removed in forest growth. Um, one key thing I want to mention here, we are working with a bunch of partners, Oregon Department of Agriculture, Department of Forestry, Metro, um, other regional state folks, as well as the federal government, uh, to start working on slowing the spread of ash. Uh, emerald ash borer and really so slowing the mortality of these trees. So stretching that curve out, it's like COVID a little bit, you know, flattening the curve, but here we're spreading it out. The trees are going to die. Um, at least that's been the experience of 35 other states. But the longer it takes, the more time we have to react, the more budget cycles we can spread it over the cost of dealing with it. Um, so the better off everybody is. And so there are efforts underway right now um, to do a lot of that work. Next slide. Um, so getting back to shade and why um, we're not um, anticipating a huge change in our shade credit portfolio. Um, so there's four key things in the way that we go about managing these. Um, first is diversity of our plant communities. And so, you know, thinking about this as a, a green and natural asset, um, we really try to build in redund redundancy and that's diversity. So you have a lot of different tree and shrub species. Um, a lot of them can fulfill uh, similar functions um, or take over, uh, especially if we're talking about shade, right? So there might be other services that you don't get, but um, there are a lot of trees that we have on these plant communities, and we'll show you some numbers in a minute. Um, we tend to plant really diverse plantings, and we tend to, using reference communities, kind of really emphasize that to make sure we have that re redundancy and resilience. Age, we've been doing this for about 17 years. The oldest ash trees we have are about 8 inches DBH diameter, uh, about this high, and 20 feet tall. The vast majority are much smaller which makes it a lot more manageable on our projects where we have shade credit to deal with. Um, so we aren't talking about a lot of removals and expensive stuff. Um, we can replace those. Um, we can generally um, let them kind of die naturally and then um, take the actions to determine that we need, excuse me. Um, so that's relatively easy and low cost. Um, shifting of plant communities. Ash are not the only thing we have out here. Rob mentioned some metrics um, that we see, like in reference communities to background along rivers and so on. Um, but I mentioned diversity. A lot of times, what we'll see is a shift from a forest, uh, ash forest, uh, or ash dominated plant community to something else, uh, maybe a little bit shorter stature, but we still have plants, we still have shade. Um, and more importantly for us, we have shade where it matters uh, based on how these systems generally look. And then finally, long term stewardship. I mentioned I'm in the stewardship division, but we stick with these long term. Um, and so we're, we're constantly thinking about um, how can we maintain this function? We know that we're going to have disturbance coming. We uh, were expecting in the last four to get here at some point. We were all hoping it would take longer. Uh, we know climate change is an issue, floods, fires. There's all types of things that can impact these systems. So we're thinking a lot about resilience. What can we do to get ahead of these and make sure that these communities, to the degree possible, and repair themselves and uh, or we have the minimal amount of inter intervention to maintain that function. Uh, so here are some actual numbers. Um, like Jamie mentioned, we do a lot of monitoring. Um, these numbers are um, basically uh, estimates from plots that we've done, but we know we have around 300,000 ash trees on our projects that are, are woody plant communities. Um, and this is the dominant plant communities that we work in. There's a couple more um, that are kind of minor players. Um, and so this is where we'll see the impact. And you can see we have these different plant communities, forested wetland repairing forest, scrub shrub, um, which is a bit shorter stature, and then upland forest. And then across the top, you can see the acreage, how many ash trees um, 
the percent of the total um, and revet is another shorthand that we have for plant community. And then the tree cover ash and the woody percent woody cover ash there. Um, and so, and then finally, the count of tree species. So in a lot of these, we have a lot of other tree species on site. Again, a lot of things to take over and ash is a big part of the tree percent tree canopy cover, but um, there's a lot more, you know. So if you look at preparing forest, 70% is not ash. Um, can you get one more? Forested wetland, that's not the case. And like Rob said here, when we say forested wetland, we really mean ash forested wetland and ash is the dominant tree species. Um, and you can see in our um, shade credit sites, ash makes up about 60% of the tree cover. Only about 25% uh, of the woody uh, cover though. So what that means is we have a lot of other woody plants, a lot of other shrubs, and we probably are gonna see a shift in some of these plant communities to probably a scrub shrub plant community. And that's a little bit shorter stature. Um, so here's an actual project site, um, and there's a lot of polygons here, um, but it kind of illustrates some of this. Um, so the top polygons, uh, you see a little FW, hopefully. Um, that's the green one there, and then downstream to your left, NSF. So that's a forested wetland on the site on Bronson Creek and then a scrub shrub wetland. Um, there's also a blue one that's kind of underneath that, that's hydric soil. And so like I said, we're expecting to see these ash start to die and probably a lot of these plant communities shift to scrub shrub, but not all of them. Um, and some work that Sean Green did a couple of years ago down in the Finley Wildlife Refuge, um, we know that if water is close to the surface within about six inches, ash are about the only tree species that can survive. Um, if it's deeper than that, there's actually oaks, alders, other things that can live. And so we have a lot of opportunity to, to maintain the forested character and maintain the level of credit that we have. Um, so we wanted to know, you know, what's our impact or what's our risk here in terms of this conversion. And we used a hydric soil layer. Hydric soils are ones that tend to produce wetland conditions. Um, you get a wetland if water is within 12 inches of the surface. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to start looking at what the risk is, but it's not the best um, or perfect allegory. But um, here you can see that hydric soil over the forest of wetland, most of it looks like it could potentially shift. Um, in the next one. Um, and then we throw in the shade credit. So Jamie mentioned we go out 135 feet. So this is the band where we could see a shifting credit from a taller forested stature to a shorter um, scrub shrub. Shade credit's really complicated and um, it depends on all types of things beneath the next one. Um, and so it turns out that 85% of our credit is actually within uh, 45 feet of the stream. And so this is the, the biggest band of concern. And I should have left the uh, forested wetland or the, the hydric soil layer on here. Actually, a good part of this is not hydric soil and we'll be able to maintain um, a fair chunk of credit as forest within this little um, red bit. But a lot of it, we expect to shift and look a little bit more like downstream. Um, and so here's some numbers here, but um, here's a visual of these pictures. The um, ash forest of wetland here at top, ash tree dominated canopy, and then the understory here is a lot of um, sluice edge. Um, below is actually the scrub shrub on that site, the polygons that we were looking at, at Bronson Creek. And you have a dark green tree that's an ash tree. So you can see that's tall. The other stuff is what we expect would take over and live well in the hydric soils, the wetter soils. Um, the scrub shrubs aren't shrubs like, you know, maybe in your yard, but they grow up to 20 feet. That's kind of the definition. That's the, what the model uses. Um, once it gets over 20 feet, it starts to be considered a forest. Um, and so with dogwoods, well as dogwoods in this picture, um, they grow really tall, and in a tiny system like this, they actually shade the entire stream. Um, so, you know, you get complete canopy cover. And so, although we're expecting a shift in the stature in a lot of these systems, we may not actually have a, a real significant change in the amount of shade that, that can be provided. Um, looking at our total credit portfolio, there's a couple ways to look at it because 85% of our credit comes from that 45 foot buffer, and it's hard to, um, to know exactly without running all the numbers, which we're preparing to do soon. But, um, somewhere between one and three percent of our credit will probably fall into this category of shifting from a forested wetland system to a shorter stature of scrub shrub. Um, I did want to mention too that a lot of our riparian forest, that's the majority of our credit. This is taller, um, tree dominated uh, stuff along streams and wetlands, streams and rivers and stuff. A little bit of that actually has hydric soil uh, overlaid with that. Um, largely, I think that's uh, inaccuracies in the hydric soil layers. Uh, when I've gone out and looked at those, but we do anticipate that some of these we may see a shift. Uh, so I didn't want to mention that. It'll be minor. Next one. Uh, so getting back to the shade credit calculation question, this is what it looks like. 
uh, this is on a different project, but we wanted to know what's the difference. So we took two segments, everything about them is the same. So I don't know how much of this you can see. And I apologize, this slide we moved. We moved that because it seemed like it made a little bit more sense. And so I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, we moved this forward from 21 to 15. Um, so the top segment is the, sorry, looking at the codes, the scrub shrub, and the bottom is the riparian forest. And there's about a 1% difference in the two with all other things being the same. And so what we're looking at is a 1% reduction on this particular system, but it is characteristic, right? These are mostly smaller systems where we have these wetland stream mosaics. And a lot of times the shrubs can pretty easily cover that. And the model is showing that we aren't seeing a huge reduction. Um, so that's a lot of the reason why we're not expecting a huge change. Um, back to the picture that Jamie showed earlier, the way that we look at shade, the red is where we can't currently do calculate shade uh, credit. We can't create uplift. We can't create any difference because it's already there. Right? Um, so right now in this particular project on the 12th river, all the green is where we can get shade credit. Um, it was basically a, a, a field before that. This was on a wildlife refuge. The red is existing ash canopy. Um, next. So I want to dive into that a little bit. If you can click one more. So here, this is on uh, East Fork of Dairy Creek. This is actually a trips e prepper veg back. This is managed by Soil and Water Conservation District, though. Um, and you can see a hydric soil in the forested wetland. Uh, so, you know, again, similar, but this is a much bigger and different system. Um, so the one we were looking at before is Bronson Creek, where you have that wetland stream complex. On Dairy Creek and most of our bigger systems, it's actually a lot drier. And here at the stream, you have kind of a natural or man made berm, and the wetlands tend to be further back, like you're seeing here. And so here's that 135 foot buffer. You can see there's only a little bit where you might expect some conversion. Most of it we can maintain a horse uh, canopy. Next. Um, I think what's really interesting on this one and a lot of these systems, like the one we were looking at before with all those little tiny rectangles, is where this 45 foot um, shade credit buffer is drawn. You can see it mostly doesn't over overlap any of the uh, colored polygons, the forest to wetland or the oak woodland there. Um, mostly, we were not able to see shade credit because there was already shade there, which is great. Um, turns out this is almost all ash shade right now. Um, and so 85% of the potential credit um, we couldn't claim, that's all about the dye. Um, and so there, it's really bad, and there's also a big uh, potential opportunity in terms of shade credit um, on projects like this where we can come in and we can start being proactive and fixing um, this thing that we know is going to happen. And you know, we can get credit for doing that likely. We need to work with EEQ. Um, our goal would be to, to really start now and so we don't have to wait for things to die and then we can go ahead and proactively replace that before we start seeing huge losses of ash along these streams. This is the case on most of the projects we see on bigger systems, the Twalt River, Dairy Creek, Gales Creek, um, McKay Creek, and so on. Um, and this is also the case, a lot of these um, areas that are ECREP, VEGFAC, and stuff like that on these systems, that 45 foot buffer often wasn't formed or couldn't be formed. It was just too close to the creek to be um, feasible. So a lot of times we see a historic buffer and mostly dominated by ash. And so there is a fair amount of opportunity and that opportunity also is an opportunity uh, for the basin because if we can get in there and bring some of this funding to bear then we can really make a positive impact um, where we're gonna see a huge impact from mineral ash flow. Um, so I think, I think that's one positive maybe coming out of this for us, it's like, um, the last thing I wanted to mention is risk. Um, and this is risk for landowners that have ash. And Clean Water Services is a natural area landowner. We don't own a lot of, lot of land, but around our treatment plants, we tend to own some. Um, the ash on that land, when it dies, tends to fail uh, relatively quickly. And what I've heard farmers say is catastrophically. When it falls, it's going to hit something, right? And so we're really interested to know um, that we, uh, what's going to happen and we can mitigate the risk on our property. So. Um, looking at um, a, a simple risk table like this, you have the likelihood of impact. Is that tree going to fall on something? And the consequences, if it falls on something, do we care? So if a tree falls in the woods on the ground, not a big deal. It, does anybody? <laughs> yeah. Um, if a tree is next to a property line and across the property line is a house, that's a big deal, right? And so we want to be proactive in figuring out where these are, figuring out what the risk is and managing it. Again, for clean water services, generally speaking, we don't have a lot of residential around the natural areas that we own, but we do have Fern Hill. So we are really interested in knowing where our exposure is there. There are a lot of trails, very popular. Um, so we want to understand that and mitigate that. And you have a lot of options. So once you do the risk assessment, you can then um, 
but really your values. Your natural resources, aesthetic, and decide what you're going to do. Are you going to remove the tree? Or are you going to treat the tree with a pesticide? You can leave it because it's really important to the people who use that area, or it's really expensive and difficult to get to. So there are a lot of options, and we can proactively look at that, and we can basically uh, mitigate that. Um, and this framework is something hopefully that other folks can use because there are a lot of natural area landowners in our basin that are going to see the similar impacts, cities, parks, and all that. And so if this is an up and coming thing that folks are going to have to start thinking about. And I think I'm going to hand it off to Jim. I also want to recognize the provided a third spot. I'm Jill Erickson. I work with Brandy and others in stewardship. So pretty sobering news, right? But what we really want you to take away from our presentation is that this program that is well established is successful. And part of why it's successful is the way that we've been managing and taking care of these areas. So um, we have a lot of resources and we have the teams. And like you've heard this evening, we're the 36th state. So we have a lot of research and a lot of resources to draw on to help us manage this. Um, it's also really important for you to keep in mind as we're talking about all of the options and talking about use. This isn't the last threat we're going to see asked about climate change. This isn't the last bug we're going to see. There's a lot more threats coming in. It's really, really important that we stay ahead of this. And that's really what managing natural systems is about. It's about being adaptive. It's about keeping your boots on the ground and working with your partners. So what are we doing? Um, it's really important that we're thinking ahead and planning appropriately with our budgets. We know that there's going to be some more costs. You heard Randy mention some of the mitigation is taking the trees out, treating them with pesticide, or leaving them be. And how are we taking care of all of this? So we're being very proactive in looking at all of our projects and how we're going to budget appropriately. We already do a lot of mo monitoring that's required and the mapping, but we're able to come to you this evening. We're able to come to leadership and say what we think our risks are because of in the monitoring and assessment that we do. Biological control, this one's really exciting. What this means, and this is already planned and going to happen at Fernhill, is we're going to release parasitic wasps that will attack the emerald ash borer. This has been tried in a lot of different areas, but never this early. And so we're very excited that research is showing that this is going to help slow the spread. Again, why do we want to slow the spread? We can't stop it. It gives us more time to mobilize, communicate, plan, and, and have the funding that we need to manage the <laughs> So again, we've been talking a lot about assessing the risk so that we can be very strategic in where we're applying our resources. Where should we be focusing? Where are the things that we need to be um, communicating more with partners? We want to be strategic in the trees that we take down. We want to use pesticide very carefully working with ODA, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon Department of Forestry. They have already set up a task force. They knew this was coming. They published a plan, a response plan in 2019. We're part of that task force. We're part following the recommendations from these agencies. Um, replanting, just getting in there, like Randy was saying, and getting those plant trees planted now so that when the ash tree do fall, that there's other trees there to take over them. And of course, participating in research and innovation so that we're continuing to learn, continuing to, continuing to share what we know with those in the Washington County area and We also talked about our shade credit. This is going to be really, really important. We've already started mobilizing how we're going to communicate with regulators. Uh, we don't want to just say, hey, it's fine, trust us, it's great. We want to be partnering with them and working with DEQ and running the new baseline so that we can demonstrate that the shade credit is a good program. It's something that's going to be around for a long time. DEQ can communicate that to the beginning, that we're, we're very confident that this is a valuable program. Next slide. I mentioned the task force that ODA and ODF are leading. They're really focused on statewide issues. But there are going to be opportunities. Um, you heard Tracy talk about it already tonight. There's going to be funding opportunities. 
And we know that one thing about this bug, it really doesn't care about boundaries. It doesn't care what county it's in, it doesn't care what state it's in. Um, it's going to be moving where the trees are. So it's really important, just like with SWCD and the, in, the, the past program that you've heard about, that we're working with these partners. Because if we work together and we're at the table, then we can do Next slide. Thank you, and the team is here to answer questions, but I do want to put it in the short time. I, I see a question from Elaine. Yes, Elaine, please. Sorry, thank you. I had to unmute myself. Um, a couple of thoughts. One is, um, at least I know Randy Robin and Rich know that I did a lot of work up at Smith and Bybee Wetlands over the last 20 years, um, including having a number of graduate students work up there. One thing we learned at Smith and Bybee is that Pacific Willow, which grows to a tree form, tolerates the same hydrology as ash. So when you're in those deeper hydric soils, please consider interplanting Pacific willow, perhaps a bit aggressively. The problem with just allowing um, systems to shift from a forested wetland to a shrub wetland is that you lose canopy complexity, you lose nesting habitat for neotropical migratory birds. Um, it's important to try to retain um, to the extent you can that complexity and of course the the greater canopy of the Pacific Willow might be helpful for shade credits. And the other thing I would give a shout out to is where you can, please consider incorporating Oregon white oak. And the reason for that is that the bark structure and the structure of the holes and the fissures, there, there are micro habitats that these floodplain ash have that provide wildlife habitat, they provide cavities for nesting birds, they provide places where raccoons and other wildlife um, may den. And really, as far as I can think of, Oregon oak is the closest analog to the Oregon ash for that kind of habitat provision. So I just wanted to put those ideas out there. Thank you. We, did we have to, or have we amended our design and construction standards for like what's required to be planted in vegetated corridors with development or, or stormwater ponds? Is that grass trees part of those plans that we remove those? We haven't, but we're looking at that. We'll definitely need to update it, it will definitely be more difficult to procure ash you're going to plant if you're doing a development. And those of you who are doing development, one thing to also consider is that European ashes and many North American ash that are hybridized and used as street trees, yard trees, park trees are also impacted by emerald ash borer. So we just focused on wild ash, as we call it, because the wild ash, the Oregon ash, are affecting stream water quality and uh, the wildlife in those areas. And that's one of Clean Water's biggest concerns. However, if you're managing an urban space, you've got trees, consider that your ash trees may be at risk. And so you can do several things. You can treat those existing trees you've got, which is a really good idea. It's a, it's a two to three year protection period to get out of some of the uh, insecticides used in them, especially if they're in a, in a safe zone for treatment. And it's a costly treatment, but it will save that tree for a long time. The second thing to think about is if you're going to plant new ash in those environments. Um, you may have to look at uh, Korean ash or Chinese ash species that are resistant to this insect um, or other species entirely. And right now, uh, the Oregon Department of Agriculture is placed in quarantine over Washington County. If you can feel the dome that descended on us in, in uh, late December, that was the dome that we were under now. And so it means no ash to go out of our county or come into our county. We're also not going to transport firewood and wood products that are basically containing their ash borers uh, larva. So <clears throat> those things are happening, but it will also make it very difficult for those of us, and I'm thinking of the agriculture folks, especially nurseries that do produce ash trees, 
um, actually going to be a uh, difficult to sell them quick. So that's, that's something to consider. And design and construction standards definitely need to respond to this. You just mentioned the Korean and Chinese ash. Yeah. I was wondering, so in East Asia, they're probably further, way further along on the curve than we are as far as infestation and such. So what did their habitats evolve to after the initial infestations? Well, in those settings, the Appalachian forest evolved with those ash trees. And those, in those cases, those ash trees have developed defenses against the emerald ash borer. They still can be impacted by it. The emerald ash borer will predate those ash trees, um, but they'll only attack them if they're stressed. Um, and usually it's sort of like what we call a secondary infestation, so it's already uh, hurting. The one thing to consider in this case, though, is that uh, if you are working with any kind of ash, be a good idea to just think really carefully about whether you even want to continue. And um, for those those of you who manage you know, urban and um, street tree or yard tree or <laughs> tree ashes to consider treating those for the long run. And it may be the case uh, that uh, the hybrid ash that we do have here in the state that are you have uh, you know, some of those East Asian strains in them, they may still be vulnerable to Apple Ash Board. In some cases, we don't know yet. So, probably one of the factors that's common. But they're, they're co evolved. That's the home for those Ash and those Apple Ash Board get along. Also, the insects that Jill mentioned, the biocontrol insects, which are wasps, and in many cases are smaller than what I can contain in my fingers here, are. Um, are also uh, co evolved, which is why they're used as a biocontrol agent because they uh, almost exclusively um, predate the larva. They'll lay their eggs into the bark that basically infest the larva and kill them. So they help reduce the, the amount of larva that are surviving in trees, which helps those trees survive the stitch. So. Do we uh, potentially see uh, vast swaths of dead trees like you can see in eastern Oregon from the pine, the pine bark needle or something like that? Yes. Is that what we're looking at? Yes. Yep. Uh, and the other is great. And it's from the east coast and exactly in that. And it gets to be really challenging too because of the mode of failure of the ash trees. So. You know, one concern is once they're dead, it's not safe to climb on them. It's really dangerous to remove them. Again, being proactive is really important. Um, and there's natural areas. It may not be as big of a deal, but if you are asking people to go out and manage something else, then it becomes a bigger risk. But one thing to consider if you are managing a grove of ash is uh, it may not be the case where you need to come in and clear cut those ash because you have to think about that some of those ash may survive, you want to keep that genetic legacy and the ability for the ash to self, basically self-select survival. So if you have ash that aren't going to pose a threat to anybody um, that may die and they're out in the woods somewhere, that may be a case where all those ash trees have the matching genetics and we want to encourage landowners not to go in and pre-cut, if you will. Uh, that's what happened during the, you know, Chestnut blight that killed the American chestnut. We killed all the trees that were potentially infected, and then we also removed all the potential genetics of trees that could have survived the blight in the next generation. So, to think about that less wheel and having that good thing. And they have kind of resistance in other ash species in North America. So, it's like they've had that in here as well. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for answering your question to one of your points. You was before I asked them, but what I is that this EAB is a year and now. So, are there anything that we know is on the horizon or on the adjacent counties or something that we can start looking at now? Uh, climate change uh, is something we're looking at right now. Um, there are other bugs too. No, I was thinking more about the kind of threat 
the entire species or but this EAP affect only actually no other species. It does impact olive trees and a couple of other more culturally interesting trees called plethora, but it's not really, it's pretty ash specific. That's, that's, it's, that's its jam, if you will. And in terms of um, other insects out there, forest pests, there's a lot of them. Uh, we, what we're mostly looking at are those that are going to come in, for example, through the ports. Uh, ash actually, the ash border got here as uh, potentially either pallet material or packing material that was wood. And then it came from um, somewhere in Asia and it, it had stowed away essentially in that material. There's thousands of other amounts of packing materials that come in all the time uh, that may or may not be, you know, treated to avoid moving insects around. Uh, there's also, you know, all kinds of stuff. Anybody with a suitcase walking through the EDX. So invaders are kind of always making their way here in ways. We just don't really know. Um, we know some of the worst pests. Asian longhorn beetle is another one that we're watching out for. And you've probably all heard of uh, spongy or gypsy moth. Uh, those are types, Japanese beetle. We've got Japanese beetle now in Washington County. So those species are things are they're either moving from somewhere else in North America where they've already established, or they're they're coming in uh, fresh. From, uh, but we are globalized <laughs> in the world and tend to move stuff around with us, unfortunately and unfortunately. So sorry, I was long answering your question. Somebody in there was my answer. Okay. <laughs> It was boring in there, I promise. I'll give the eye thing boring. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Okay, uh, we've come to our public comment period for the meeting. If you want to speak, yes, then we will start a two minute timer. Gail? Gail, see, who's the timer? Give me 10 seconds. Stop. I went to the Environmental Law Education Center conference today from 8 30 to 4 30. It was based on the Clean Water Act. A lot of things that were discussed here was discussed there by experts and by non experts. The Honorable Jeff Berkeley gave the keynote. It was very informative. Kathleen George, she's the chair of the Environmental Equality Commission. She also did a wonderful speech. And Honorable Ken Helm is the chair of the House Committee on Agriculture, Land Use, and Water. This speech was very informative too. Let us know how to network with him, get our input to him. Uh, Jennifer Wagle, she's the Quality Quality Administrative Department, Department of Environmental Equality. Anyway, it was a wonderful, informative conference. Uh, Chris Holm, she's the chair of the Working Association of Clean Water Agencies, and you know, addressed PFAS chemicals and everything done with, with those chemicals. No easy answers, but there are a lot of uh, assumptions, just like there's no easy answer to this boring. This is not an easy answer. Okay. And so, uh, moderator of toxics and water quality, David Fair from uh, Public Health, gave a good presentation on that. And Kevin Masterson, he used to work for 27 years at DEQ, toxic coordinator for that. So, I just want to say it was taped, and uh, we'll share that tape with some decision makers. And if any of you want to get involved and learn what they said, Share it with Diane and other people. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we have 37 seconds. Let me just stop and think about what I said. <laughs> Silence. Else. So, we, there are a lot of complex issues. Uh, Clean Water Services is trying to address them. There are assumptions made on things, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Climate change was something that was issued. It was talked about a lot. It's going to impact everybody. And so, as discussed here, it impacts uh, our environment a lot. So, just appreciate the time to share a little bit with you and hopefully be able to learn more what I learned today. Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, Mark, uh, announcements? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for being back together and happy new year. I'm glad we have everyone here. 
Elaine, it's nice to have you online. I'm glad you're there too. We almost have a complete full house. Thank you. A um, couple of announcements. One is, as Jamie mentioned before, our new permit, which we will review every five years. And then this went into effect nine days ago, 11 days ago. So we're in that. Um, our regulatory affairs staff will be here next month to talk a little bit about how that permit's got going into place. Those of you that have been on the commission have been working on that and seen that work for many, many years now. So that's happening. The other thing I wanted to uh, say is every other year, it's been a long time now because of the pandemic, every other year we do a joint meeting with our board of directors. And we typically do that as a barbecue and a canoe trip up to Fall River. And we've set that for Thursday, September 14th. You can write it down. And we'll also send you a calendar invitation. We're giving you plenty of notice for that so you can, you know, stand up paddleboard or kayak or get in a canoe race or something like that. Prepared for that come the 14th. And the last announcement I have is our next meeting is on Wednesday, uh, February 8th. That's all I have, Jim. Great. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> well, I think with that, we're adjourned. Thank you for your. Hang out till nine o'clock with us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We drive safely. It says heavy rain soon. Oops. Maybe we're getting a bit of a good thing. I don't know if there's a California coming in.